professor in the field of aerospace engineering. He is a well-known name in the aerospace industry, having made several contributions in the development of launch vehicles and missiles for ISRO and DRDO. He has several new test techniques and facilities for high-speed wind tunnel testing of models related to national aerospace program such as variable max number flexible nozzles, passive and active ejector systems, and systems for dynamic stability testing. His research interests include reduction of aerodynamic drag, innovations in active and passive flow control, unsteady aerodynamics, air intake aerodynamics, and transonic flow. He is a research ambassador of the German Academy of Exchange Services and is currently guiding doctoral students at IIC and IIT Madras. Sir is also an integral part of our institution. Many of our students have had the privilege of being taught by him and have benefited greatly from his expertise and guidance. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Sir with a big round of applause. Thank you. Okay, so let me just uh, start off with some introduction. Um, you know, air intake is essentially a, a, a component of an engine which has to be designed by the airframe designer. The guy who makes the engine is different, the guy who makes the airframe is different in aerospace practice. So you will find that uh, quite often the design philosophy is you select one engine and to get the best out of engine, what is the best airframe that you can do? So the engine is separate, airframe is different. So that's how F-16 came into being. Uh, engine was given, engine has got this kind of performance. You give me the best airframe, which does maximum maneuverability, which is super maneuverable, which can uh, give a fantastic performance, which is that airframe. So the guys went about designing the airframe, and then they decided on a configuration which was given by uh, McDonnell Douglas. That's how F-16 came up. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that a engine, a given engine can be fitted to various types of uh, airframes. Okay, you have, for example, G404 going on LCA. You have G404 going on 10 other aircraft as well. But the airframe is different. So it's the job of the airframe designer to match the engine with the airframe. Okay, so that's where a lot of challenges happen. Because, uh, you know, all uh, turbojet engines, for example, they all have circular cross-section. So the air which goes into the compressor must have a uniform pressure profile. If you look at LCA, it's got two side intakes, okay? And these two side intakes suck the air, and then the air goes into a complicated passage, and finally the passage becomes circular. So you have two asymmetric uh, sides from where the air comes up. Suppose, suppose the aircraft is doing a side slip, or it's taking a turn, or it's doing an angle of attack maneuver. Then the air that comes from two sides is not identical. You might have higher pressure on one side, lower pressure on one side. So when it meets the compressor face, it experiences very complicated flow profiles. The pressure is not uniform. So the airframe designer has to uh, look at what is the kind of distortion that happens. You look at the worst maneuvering condition of the aircraft. Under that condition, what is the distortion in the plane of the compressor, of the engine? So whether the engine can take that or not is a issue. So all engine manufacturers, they give you some rating. What is the specification of the engine? It says how much dis distortion it can take. This distortion could be steady distortion. That means the mean profile, pressure profile, can be so much different from the instantaneous profile. Even then, engine will function. And there is also something called dynamic distortion. OK, there what happens is you look at the, um, essentially, pressure is unsteady. It's not constant. It's changing with time. So you look at the maximum pressure. Look at the minimum pressure at any instant of time. So what is P dash max minus P dash min divided by P, P average? Okay, So that is referred to as a count. How much is it different from being steady state? So engine manufacturer says, my engine will perform even if the count is so much. So you take any 60 degree segment in the plane of the air intake in, the, in front of the compressor and look at this, qualify this distortion. What is the maximum distortion? And if it's within that limits, engine is supposed to perform. Okay, this is how air intakes are tested. 
okay so this is for a regular uh, turbojet engine so that is the introduction so this is a regular turbojet engine you can see it has got so many parts you have a spike in the front and you have a compressor you have turbine uh, you have a combustion chamber and you have nozzle and all that this is one of the well known engines and uh, this is an engine without any moving part okay so the feature of ramjets and scramjets is that there are no moving parts but then the basic brayton cycle is the same that means you have to have compression you have to have combustion you have to have uh, expansion and all that so in case of uh, ramjet engine and uh, scramjet engines these perform without any moving parts that means the compression expansion everything is done using aerodynamic controls aerodynamic devices that's the basic philosophy of ramjet engine the advantage of this is that uh, the weight becomes very small and you can propel at much higher speeds so if you want to fly above 2.5 or mach 3 engine the best engine is a ramjet engine because there are no moving parts of course the disadvantage is that when it's on the ground it doesn't produce any thrust because the oncoming air is not good enough the kinetic energy is not good enough okay so most often what is done you have a, you want to propel a vehicle at uh, say mark 3 or mark 4 you accelerate the vehicle to mark 4 using maybe a solid rocket vehicle and then you the uh, solid rocket consume i mean uh, is fully consumed then you switch over to ramjet mode okay so initially you need that thrust initially you need some momentum so that it goes at supersonic speed then you switch over to uh, ramjet mode so this is one good example so you have the oncoming oncoming stream okay so oh, what happened okay so you have the oncoming stream and you have a air intake here okay this you can call it as a center body or a spike okay the purpose of this spike is to create a shock wave here okay now shock wave as we heard in the morning the basic property is to increase the pressure okay but we have to understand very clearly what exactly we mean by pressure okay when you are flying at a high altitude the start the pressure in the atmosphere is quite low in fact as you go higher and higher the atmospheric pressure keeps dropping so the densities are also low now the property of shock wave is that there is an increase in the static pressure there is an increase in the temperature behind the shock wave but there is also a total pressure loss okay and this total pressure loss is reflected in the form of increase in entropy also increase in temperature and so on okay so we would like to have we would like to have shocks where the pressure loss is minimum and your total pressure recovery is maximum okay that means if you have uh, let's say one bar pressure here and what sucks in here if you can get one bar okay because one bar is the static pressure total pressure and the static pressure is very very low okay maybe uh, 0.2 0.3 bar but the air that comes here must have pressure which is equal to the total pressure in the atmosphere so suppose i measure the total pressure here and the total pressure here how much have i recovered that quantity is called the pressure recovery okay how much pressure i have recovered how much total energy i have recovered from the by converting the kinetic energy to pressure this is one important parameter another important parameter is how much is the mass flow how much is the mass flow that is going through the intake because the thrust it produces is directly proportional to mass flow rate okay and suppose vj is the exit velocity and vi is the inlet velocity so you take this difference in the velocity multiply by the mass flow it directly gives you the thrust okay all jet engines that is a feature and so much so with the ramjet as well so you have what's called a, so in this portion what's happening is you create a shock wave and our ideal conditions what we expect is that this shock should glance on the should touch the lip okay it should not come out okay it can be inside the shock can go inside but it should not come out the maximum limit is it should touch the cowl lip okay so that condition will give you maximum pressure recovery okay suppose you have a um, case where the shock has come out you can have situation where the shock comes out then the, there is a huge loss in the pressure recovery and if you have lost the pressure recovery you lose thrust okay so these are the uh, essential features then you have so there are no moving parts here all are static parts and in the so the shock waves 
have uh, compressed this air and you have high pressure air and you have combustion and due to combustion you have increase in temperature and consequent pressure and then you are throwing out the uh, ex exhaust jet with a high supersonic Mach number. So your Vj becomes very high and you get the thrust. Okay, This is a feature of ramjet. Now one important feature of uh, combustion here is that you need to sustain the flame. Okay, How do you sustain the flame at a high speed? It's a big challenge because uh, you, you know, for example you switch on a uh, roof um, overhead fan and try to light a matchstick. You will find it blows off because wind blows in all directions. And that speed is hardly 20, 25 km per hour. So if you are having very high speeds here, the, air will, the flame will not sustain, the flame will go away, flame will extinguish. So how do you hold the flame? It's one of the challenges. So in case of ramjet engines, what happens is the velocity is decelerated here so that you get a, okay, uh, the, the velocity is decelerated, converted to pressure so that here you have a low velocity. Okay, Typical combustion Mach numbers in a ramjet are 0.4. Okay, the vehicle is flying at Mach 2 or Mach 3, but the Mach number here inside the combustion chamber is hardly 0 0.2, 0 0.3. In fact, the smaller it is, better it is for the ramjet because you have enough time for combustion and you get the required thrust. Now, this concept is there on uh, many vehicles. I'll just go through some, like this is a sample ramjet engine and uh, this is Akash. Everybody knows what is Akash? It's a ramjet engine. There are four intakes, okay. This is initially propelled using solid propellant and when it reaches about Mach 2, 2.5, this uh, covers come off and then the intake starts. It flies in the ramjet mode and this is an operational ramjet missile which is uh, being manufactured by BDL, Bharat Dynamics Limited, okay. And uh, Defense Ministry has given them order for producing uh, Akash missiles and the cost is about 600 crores. Okay. Yeah, Akash. It's being done by BDL, Bharat Dynamics Limited. I think it's in Hyderabad, right? Or Trivandrum? Okay. Uh -huh. Trivandrum, I thought Brahm, Brahmos was in Trivandrum, I've seen that. Okay. All right, so this is another configuration, it's called SFDR or solid fuel ducted ramjet. So here the fuel, the primary fuel used is a solid rocket and uh, after the vehicle is propelled, you have the ramjet engines at the bottom, they produce a thrust after the vehicle reaches Mach 2 and uh, you have several Examples of ramjet, this is X-15 aircraft with ramjet engine. This is BrahMos, you have already seen that. Okay, this is again ramjet, this is not supersonic combustion, this is subsonic combustion. Okay, so now when you come to supersonic combustion, there is a big difference. The Mach number in the combustion chamber should be more than one. Okay, so here the idea is that the, uh, the residence time for the fuel to burn and complete combustion becomes very, very small when you have such high Mach numbers. So the design of the combustor, the ability to hold the flame in a supersonic condition, that's one of the biggest challenges in the scramjet engines. You should be able to sustain the flame. So how do we do that? Let me come to that a little later, okay? So these are the aspects of uh, RAM. So these are scramjet powered missiles. I think the top one is US, uh, lower one is also maybe French. So you can see the intake here. These are scramjet powered missiles. Okay, the reason of, uh, the, the importance of these is that you have heard of hypersonic missiles, okay, and that's a global threat. So it's being said that China has made hypersonic missiles and there is so much of a fear uh, com complexion spread <laughs> all over the world. We don't know how true it is, but the fact is that it's a deadly, <coughs> very deadly uh, situation. Okay, this is another scramjet powered missile. And what is this? Everybody knows? This is called hypersonic. hypersonic uh, scramjet uh, technology demonstrator vehicle. So here, uh, I think we also saw some uh, presentation from uh, uh, Shisha yesterday. He was showing some internal flow characteristics. Okay, so this is a very recent news that US has also come up with a scramjet uh, missile. This is very recent news. And Boeing is looking at a Mach 5 hypersonic plane. 
and this shows a photograph of that. Okay, so you can see how slender it is, extremely slender because the thickness of the wing has to be very very small to achieve uh, low drag condition. So it becomes a totally different concept. Sir, missile lift while takeoff. Like in case of missile, you can have solid propeller. Yeah. yeah. Not, I'm sorry, you can't put solid propeller. Yeah, you must have conventional uh, uh, methods for takeoff. Mm -hmm. So you, you must reach hypersonic condition. Then it's scramjet can take over. So with the wings being that thin, do you think it will be able to sustain? Like yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what happens? The runway length becomes very large. You have to generate very high uh, takeoff speeds because if you have, yeah, right. So if you have nicely thick, rounded wing, wings, rectangular plan form, that's the one which gives you best efficiency. Rectangular wing or elliptical plan form wing with thick leading edge. That's one of the best configurations for takeoff. But that is the worst for flying at high speeds. Your critical Mach number becomes very small. Yeah, very much. Yes, very important. What is the shape of the intake? It's what that, that's what all aerodynamics are bothered about. What should be the shape of the intake? It depends on uh, what exactly is your mission profile. If you want to fly at Mach 3, the shape is different. If you want to fly at Mach 6, the shape is completely different. And what is your mass flow requirement? How much is the thrust that you want? All that will go to the design of the air intake. Okay, so uh, this I already covered briefly. Okay, why do we need to test an air intake? These are the reasons. Because the, the guy who has designed the airframe, he should come with an intake which matches with the engine. So engine airframe integration is one of the real challenges when you want to build an aircraft. And especially so when it is supersonic. Okay, so as I told you, there are two uh, important factors. One is the uh, pressure ratio or the total pressure ratio. And the other is, uh, okay, these are the defects that you can expect in an air intake, okay, duct. Then the mass flow rate. What is the, how much mass flow can it support? Okay, so if you look at this variation, how the mass flow rate changes with uh, pressure recovery, this is a very classic curve. Every intake has this kind of feature, okay. As you um, increase the mass flow rate, the pressure ratio recover starts increasing up to some level, then it starts dropping off. So this point is called the critical point. This region is called the critical point. This region is called supercritical. This is called subcritical. Okay. So the features are that if you are in the supercritical range, if you reduce the mass flow rate, the pressure is it's constant up to some value. Then it starts increasing. It's got the maximum value. Now in this, uh, I think I'll explain with uh, another sketch. So the uh, the transition from supercritical to subcritical is a very, very dicey point. It's a very delicate point, which is of fundamental importance for performance of a intake, a ramjet or scramjet air intake. Because if you are on the left side of this curve, if you are in the subcritical range, you get into shock oscillations. And so you will find shock instead of being inside the intake or just at the plane of the cowl lip, it starts coming out. And when it comes out, you will have a shock in the nozzle portion of the air intake. You know, air intake is like a um, convergent divergent passage and no shock is stable in the convergent portion shocks are always stable in the divergent portion so if you put the shock in the no nozzle portion in the convergent portion it just spills out okay and then it starts oscillating violently it's called as buzz so air intake buzz is one of the most serious problems in scramjet and ramjet air intakes so if you are if you're coming with a new design of a ramjet engine you need to know where I should operate this air intake, at what point. So most preferred choice is to the right of the critical point, never to the left. So where is this point? In a given design, where is that point? One has to determine through experiments, okay? That's how the design becomes very important. Now if you, if you design it, I mean you can't design it for subcritical condition because when the shock is uh, coming out of the air intake, what that means is that there is a reverse law inside the combustion chamber. Instead of air going from left to right, air will start going from right to left. And that's a good case for flame, flame to go out. Because you are blowing in one direction and you are blowing in the reverse direction. So flame will go out and the engine will stop. Okay, so uh, one of the serious issues when you are changing the mass flow rate is that uh, let's say you are varying the mass flow rate 
you are reducing the mass flow rate, you are reducing your fuel consumption in a certain sequence, then this point has a sudden drop, okay. So this point, you up to this point it is critical, it's safe, no problem. If you come to the left, there is a sudden loss of total pressure because the shock goes out. Now you start relieving the adverse uh, you know, effect, that means you start relieving, reducing the back pressure, you are, you are relieving the intake from the combustion effects, then it doesn't go back in the same way, it has a loop like this, so it forms a hysteresis loop, okay. So in this region, the engine is highly unstable, you will not be able to control it. So there are a lot of examples where this becomes a serious issue. For example, LCA, uh, you, as you said, it's got two intakes. Now suppose you want to put a refueling probe on the aircraft or you want to put some uh, probe, maybe angle of attack probe or uh, yaw probe you want to put. Suppose that probe happens to be in front of the intake, okay. Now wake from that device will enter the intake and it is asymmetric. And if you have this slipstream or this uh, wake kind of flow going into the intake, it becomes unstable. So always there is a challenge. You have already made the aircraft. Now you want to convert it into, uh, I mean, you want to modify that so that you can refuel it in flight. Where will you put the refueling probe? You have to put it in such a way that this margin is not affected. So do a lot of detailed studies whether you are you are eating into the buzz margin or not. So this is one of the problems in any uh, air intake. Okay. So the mass flow. Now, when you test an air intake, you are testing it at the cruise condition. You want to test how it flies I mean, in, the, in the flying condition. Aircraft may be flying at say 60,000 feet and the engine is consuming certain mass flow and it's got some uh, total temperature in the, in the medium and all that. Now, you're not testing the actual aircraft. You're making a model. In the wind tunnel, we test only models, okay? Because be before testing, you can't fly. You have to test, confirm, then only you can fly. So there is a non-dimensional parameter which is called the mass flow parameter. This parameter you have to simulate, okay. So in a flow passage, when the A, that is the area of minimum area of flow, it becomes A star, okay. That we call it as choking condition, right. In a flow passage where, where you have area as minimum, you get a sonic condition there that's called as a choke throat. And the, when the local Mach number is 1, it gets maximum mass flow. And uh, if you change the mass flow, uh, there will be imbalance. You, because the engine cannot take extra mass. The engine <coughs> can take only certain amount of mass. If there is extra mass, it will throw it out. And it triggers buzz, okay. So when you are testing an engine uh, intake, you need to simulate the mass flow parameter, okay. So uh, okay, so if you have ramjet, you, you have subsonic combustion. And a typical operating range for a ramjet is Mach number 2.5 to 5. And if you want to exceed 5, you have to go to ramjet combustor. You can't have a ramjet engine. Okay, so these are uh, very typical features of intake. If you are flying an aircraft up to, let's say, Mach 1.8, 1.9, they use what's called a pitot intake. Okay, this, oh my, okay. So this type of intake is called a pitot intake. Okay, here, what you will find is that you get a, you have a Mach number more than one. Let's say you have a Mach number of 1.8, 1.9, something like that. And then you get a normal shock in front of the intake. Okay. Now, at that Mach number, the loss of total pressure is not a very great deal. Maybe 5%, 10% of that order. So engine can still perform. You don't need any extra devices. So if you look at uh, jet in uh, aircraft flying up to 1.82, you don't find any complex intake geometry. It's fairly straightforward. So those things are called pitot intake. So in that pitot intake, you have just one shock sitting at the lip, and that's a normal shock. Now, as you go to higher and higher speeds, what you will find is that the shock strength becomes more and more, pressure loss becomes more and more. So instead of having one strong normal shock, suppose I have two oblique shocks, then my total pressure loss will be reduced. I can get the same pressure recovery with multiple oblique shocks, in, instead of having single normal shock. So I can design the front intake, the front portion of the air intake such that I get multiple shocks. Okay, for example here, I have one ramp to turn the flow to create one shock. Then I have another ramp which will give me another shock. Then I have another ramp here which will give me another shock. 
And so the idea here is at the location where you have the normal shock, the shock strength becomes weak. So you have the shock as close to 1 as possible. So make the normal shock Mach number equal to 1. So you get maximum pressure recovery. So this chart tells you how many shocks, uh, yeah, what is the pressure recovery versus Mach number for different types of shocks. So if you had only one shock and you want to fly at Mach 3, your uh, pressure uh, recovery will be just about 80 percent. That means 20 percent energy is lost. On the other hand, uh, if you are flying at uh, uh, 2.5, with single shock that is a problem. If you have two shocks, it uh, it is uh, from about 0.65, you can get about 0.85. So if you have three shocks, your recovery is higher. And if you have multiple shocks, you have even higher. So the limit here is you have infinite number of shocks. Okay? And such an intake is called isentropic intake. You have very long intake with very small number, large number of small, small um, turning angles so that you get very weak shock. But the disadvantage is the length becomes infinitely long. You cannot have a very long intake. You can't, you can't have an intake which is 10 meters long in uh, length. Okay? Engine is small, but your intake is 10 meters. Doesn't make sense. Okay? So you have to make a compromise. So you decide, when you design the intake, you decide your Mach number and decide how many shocks you will design it for. These are obtained by design. Okay? You have to design in such a way that at the critical condition, this shock just glances on the lip. Okay. Now, the funny thing here is that when we have combustion here, downstream you have combustion, and because of combustion, there is a heat addition, there is a pressure rise. Now, for the air which is coming inside, this is like an adverse pressure gradient. Air always tries to go from, wants to go from high pressure to low pressure. Okay, so if this pressure is too high, okay, this has got momentum and that has to push through the combustion chamber, otherwise air will not go out. Okay, so the consequence of this pressure is to increase the back pressure. Okay, so this in reality, we refer to it as uh, thermal throttling. You are adding heat and it creates adverse pressure, so it is like, you know, um, creating a uh, throttling. Yeah. So for the aircrafts and everything that you mentioned that uh, are you know currently in development or currently are hypersonic or extremely highly supersonic, uh, are they made to maneuver as well or only to be extremely stable? Because then they change the angle. Good question. What happens is at such conditions the uh, drag is so high that you can't afford to make any maneuvers. You can fly at constant conditions. The moment you make a maneuver, you generate huge number of shocks and the Mach number drops. So even supersonic, it's only for a certain duration of flight. Uh, for example, uh, if you take a fighter aircraft, it may fly in supersonic mode for just about five ten minutes. Because the moment you do a maneuver, drag goes up, the Mach number drops. It's usually for cruise condition. Okay, so if you have uh, uh, this, you can call it as uh, okay. So here, what you have, this shock from the from this is called a ramp. That's called the cowl. From the ramp, you have the shock, the leading shock, which is just glanced on the cow lip. Then you have one more shock here. So you have Mach number more than one. This is an oblique shock, so you have Mach number more than one. And you have a normal shock here. Across the normal shock, the Mach number is always subsonic. So you have the uh, flow going in this direction. So this here, you have a subsonic internal compression. You have a supersonic inter external compression. So these are called mixed compression kind of intake. Okay, so different modes of operation. As I said, when you have a subcritical situation, the back pressure here won't allow this air to escape, go pass through the intake. That creates an adverse pressure. So the shock is actually pushed out and the shock comes out of the intake. Now at any instant, so what you will find is that the air instead of going here, it can also go through the upper side. Okay? The maximum mass flow it can take is based on this area. Okay? But if this is running full, you get the maximum mass flow. If you have a shock which is outside the air intake, then air will escape like this. And that only, not only creates spillage, it's called the spillage drag. It's drag due to this mass flow being spilled out. And also the mass flow here is less. You are designed for a certain thrust. If the mass flow reduces, you don't get the thrust. Okay? So all air intakes have to be operated either in the supercritical range, but just close to the critical range. So this is decided by 
how much fuel you are burning, what is the rate of fuel consumption. If you burn at a very high rate, you will hit the subcritical condition. If you are flying, if you are flying, if you are operating with a low burn rate, you are in the supercritical range. So the the, the guy who runs the ramjet, uh, who develops the fuel controller, he should operate within those limits. Okay, and this is the mass flow through the passage which you would have seen in your theory classes. So what happens in the engine? You are increasing T naught. That means you are supplying heat, and that causes reduction in mass flow rate. Okay, so this is known as thermal throttling. It's like reducing, the, you are controlling the heat, so it, we call it as thermal throttling. Now, in wind tunnel tests, usually there is no provision for heat addition, because wind tunnels don't have provision for combustion. Combustion is a different activity. So what we do is keep the T naught same and vary the A, vary the A star. So you are controlling the geometry of the air intake. By controlling the exit passage, what you are doing is a geometric throttling. What happens in reality is thermal throttling. Now these two are equivalent and given by uh, this expression. Okay, mass flow rate is uh, proportional to A star divided by square root of T naught. Okay, so in all experiments, most of the air intake experiments, what you find is there is no combustion, but the back pressure is varied by using by changing the area, and reduction of area is very easy. You just put a plug and keep moving the plug inside the intake, so that you get the uh, that's also called as uh, throttling ratio. That is, if you take the full open area, it's one, and if you keep on reducing the exit area, you are say you say you are throttling the intake. Okay, so the, in the space missions, there are a lot of advantages. These uh, air breathing engines they come under a separate category called rocket-based combined cycle operation. It's almost similar to the Brayton cycle, and uh, this involves combination of rockets, ramjets, or scramjets. So these are a lot, there are a lot of examples where this uh, combined cycle operation is utilized. Okay, so let's come to the research topic what I was uh, dealing with. This uh, vehicle was called ATV, Advanced Technology Vehicle, which was uh, being uh, developed by ISRO. And the feature of that, it's a two-stage rocket. And uh, there are four intakes, as you can see, there are four rectangular intakes and there is a central body. And uh, the ramjet combustion happens in the second, this is the first stage, this is the first stage, and this is the second stage. So the first stage takes the vehicle to high Mach number, uh, and then the uh, intake is opened, and the, air, the combustion have four air intakes, they dump air into a common chamber here, which is called the dump area. And from there onwards, combustion happens, and it goes into ramjet mode. So the challenge here was, if you have one intake, it's quite complicated. When you put four of them together, it becomes even more complicated. When you test such an intake, you don't understand anything because there are four of them. And you have combination of angle of attack, side slip, blah, blah, blah. So the idea was to understand one intake, do proper research on one intake, understand how it behaves, then you look at four intakes. Okay, so the challenges here are that uh, the operating Mach number range is 1.823, and uh, you need to make a lot of measurements, steady pressure measurements, unsteady pressure measurements, flow visualizations, and measure all the uh, performance parameters, and whether you can do this, do computations on this. The idea of our computations is that you can have a very well, well uh, validated model. The, that's the main advantage of CFD. You, once you have a validated code, you can play with the code and what 100 experiments you can't do, you can do using CFD. You're saving so much time. That's the utility of uh, CFD. Okay, so this results, uh, the uh, result of this investigation resulted in fairly large number of uh, publications. So I'll uh, summarize whatever uh, we have done. Okay, so this is the air intake, right? This is just one intake. Now, this intake has got two ramps. This ramp is for Mark II and this ramp is for Mark IV, uh, Mark uh, III. And in the actual flight vehicle, there is a sliding mechanism which move, moves these plates. Okay, in flight, when the vehicle is at Mark II, it has this uh, shape. And this whole thing is moved forward to get this shape so that this angle can be changed. That is the design of the flight vehicle. Okay, so the air comes like this. And this plane we refer to as the dump plane. 
because this is where the air is entering the circular part of the uh, vehicle. So now to change the mass flow rate, what has been done is we we'll put a valve here. This is a valve here. It's like a it's what they call as a butterfly valve. If the valve is aligned with the flow, you have maximum area. If the valve is rotated by 90 degrees, it closes the passage. So such a valve is called butterfly valve. And the range of operation is 0 to 90. Okay. So you can uh, either fully open or fully close the valve during the testing. Okay. This is a picture of the model. So you have, uh, this is uh, I think Mark 3 ramp. And uh, there are a lot of pressure taps on the top, on the, on the top and the bottom. And you have a rake here to measure the total pressure profiles. And you also have rakes in the, just to be behind the throat. These are all the pressure taps which are used for making steady pressure measurement. Here the side has been, one side of the model has been removed so that you can see the inside component. And this is where the valve is located. At the end, okay. So this is the end of the model. And below the tunnel, drill a hole and put a stepper motor here so that you can change the position of the valve. Now, this is an intermediate test facility where the typical test duration is of the order of three minutes. So whatever you want to do in one test, you have to finish it three minutes. So how do you make it efficient? You cannot have a man, man sitting there and doing all this. When testing is going on, you should be watching, watching the results. You cannot be twiddling with these controls, etc., etc. So you need an automated system. All right. So what was done was, okay. Now suppose you, I change this angle. Zero is uh, fully open. About 50, uh, if you go to about 50 degrees, the area ratio between the throat and the exit, it varies like that. Okay, for different ramps. So this was uh, uh, we put a stepper motor. A stepper motor normally has 200 pulses. That is, if you give 200 pulses, it makes 360 degrees. So every pulse will rotate it by 1.2 degrees. Now the range of angular movement is quite small, only up to uh, only up to 50 degrees, because beyond that flow becomes subcritical, so there is no point in testing. <clears throat> okay, so you have to develop an automatic control system, and you need to move the valve in a very slow fashion. If you move it by 1.2 degree every pulse, you have a very coarse control. You don't get a fine control. To make it fine control, you have to increase the um, increase the or reduce the area, rate of area, rate of area change. So if you put a gearbox with a certain reduction ratio, the movement becomes 0.12 degree per pulse. So you give one pulse to the motor, it moves only 0.1 degree. So I can get a very fine control on the movement. So I have a fine control on the exit area. Okay. So now when you acquire the data, this is a very important aspect. We do what's called handshake mode of operation. You ask the, uh, first you acquire the data, start the wind tunnel, start the testing activity, acquire the data. Now after acquisition is over, you send a command to the motor, uh, saying that acquisition is over, you go to the next position. Then the stepper motor goes to that position, gives a signal, I have gone there, I have settled. Now you trigger a pulse to acquire the data. After acquisition is over, you repeat it. So what happens in a time of three seconds, you can get, uh, as a three minutes, you can get enormous amount of data because you are not doing anything in your hand. It's done by the system. So you need to develop a control system for this. You can't do a manual system. So imagine in case of shock tube, here we are talking of three minutes. In case of shock tube, typical time is 100 milliseconds. So what's the requirement for controls? You can imagine. Okay. For example, if, if your test time is uh, 100 microseconds, you need sensors, you need uh, systems which will uh, operate at maybe nanoseconds time. So it becomes very expensive. You know, acquisition of data in such a fine scale becomes quite expensive. Okay, so this is a, uh, okay, one more point. How do you measure the output? How do you know how much it has moved? So you need to have another measurement system. So we put a potentiometer and uh, got the output from the potentiometer. Now you can see what is your command, what is your response. Okay, if you have designed a good control system, the difference between command and feedback should be zero. I ask the system to go to 15 degrees, and at 15 degrees I check it must be 15 degrees. Okay, then only my control system is working properly. So here you can see the forward command for going forward, command for going back. 
and you can see uh, you can so you can fit a line so now what you do you don't measure theta in the experiment you measure only the voltage because voltage you can acquire on computer okay so you measure any voltage you know what is the angle that's the advantage okay so this is the control system okay now uh, okay you can compare here the in a, any control in a stepper motor control system the minimum error you can get is one pulse that is you ask the system to move by 100 you give 100 pulses it can go 101 or 99 so one pulse is a typical error so in this case because of the gearbox maximum error it can have is it cannot exceed 0.12 okay so you can see here what's the difference between command and feedback the maximum error is within 0.12 so i can believe my system and go ahead so you imagine the kind of care that you need to take when you are doing experiment okay so this is the intake model and this is model in the test section of the of the 1 foot uh, 0.3 meter wind tunnel and uh, okay now what happens you are actually changing you are throttling the exit you are throttling this exit and you want to measure mass flow okay so to measure mass flow we make uh, total pressure measurement static pressure measurement you can calculate the velocity and you can have a uh, you can discretize the domain into some finite number of cells calculate what is the mass flow in every cell and then take the aggregate so now if you are throttling at the exit that is the exit is here the exit plane of the model is here okay that's where throttling happens now there is a pipe here it's a rectangular pipe it's about 15 hydraulic diameters in length so the standard reference is uh, you should measure 10 diameters downstream if you have created disturbance you can't measure immediately if you go more than 10 hydraulic diameters the disturbances due to the throttling would have uh, died out and you get a good result so you put a rake here to measure the static pressure total pressure from there you can calculate the mass flow so this is how it looks there are you subdivide this flow channel into 25 panels and you quantify what is the mass flow in every panel and you can sum it up. Okay, so these are uh, Schlieren pictures. This is at uh, Mach number of 1.8 and the exit has been varied. The exit area has been varied using the uh, valve. So what you find here when the exit area is 1.6 times the throat area, this is a shock pattern. So you have a a weak bow shock here and this is a shock coming from the cowl lip and just see that these two are intersecting someone is asking about what happens if you have intersecting shocks okay so this that actually triggers instability if you have two shocks hitting each other you get slipstream what's called a slipstream and that slipstream is a violent shear layer across which you have very large changes in velocity pressure is nearly constant but velocity um, fluctuates a lot so it triggers instability so as you reduce the back pressure, let's say you have come to 0.48 times. That means exit is only 0.48 times of the entry, of the throat. Then you get what's called a standing shock here. Okay, this is a shock sitting right in the front. So you will get very low energy flow in the air intake. Okay, now when you go to another condition, okay, this is a mark 2 and 2.5. Okay, so you find similar pattern this is a supercritical flow and that is a subcritical flow because shock has come out okay this is for mark 2.5 and you can see the shock has come out of the intake so it's very highly unstable flow okay this is again that uh, as you throttle it further uh, what are the flow pictures so you can see the flow has become uh, subcritical when you increase the back pressure okay I have one movie here. Now there is a little history. How do I run this? How do I play this movie? Oops. Okay. okay. So here, what has happened? The the, wind, the flow has started at Mach two condition, and the valve is fully open. I don't have a separate video for it. It will not play. All right. So this is a condition where the exit is fully open, 
that means maximum favorable pressure for the flow. Now as I throttle, you can see that at some point of time, the shock comes out and this whole system starts violently oscillating like this. And the worst case is when that oscillation matches, the oscillation frequency matches with the natural frequency of the intake. So you can see intake actually bouncing up and down. I was lucky that there was no damage, okay. And uh, there is a nice story behind this. This was being done by one of my students and I, I was in the control room and I was telling her, if you see that problem, you immediately stop the testing. But she was seeing this kind of pattern for the first time, so she got mesmerized. She was kept on seeing this and I'm telling her to stop because across the control room and the tunnel area, there is a wall. You can only do hand signals, you can't spray, you can't load. I'm telling her to stop. She's having emergency stop. She is not listening to because you got a brain freeze. If you are seeing something for the first time, this is what happens. You get mesmerized. Keep on looking at it. What's happening? Fortunately, there is no damage. Okay. Okay. So this is taken at uh, using a normal video camera, which works at uh, 25 frames per second. So here, what we have done is, in order to give you the visual impression, I put some color filters so that the schlieren schlieren is essentially a shadow. Schlieren is not a color picture. Schle basic schlieren is a shadow. Now, any shadow is always black and is always black. Whatever is the color of the source, shadow is always black. So the basic feature is black image. But I have put a filter so that you can see some colors. Okay. So for scientific investigation, we always use black and white. We never use color pictures. If you have color pictures, you should convert it to black and white, convert it to grayscale, and then do the analysis. Okay. Color pictures look very nice, but scientifically they are not accurate. You have to have black and white pictures only. Okay, I have another movie. This is at Mark III. Uh, this was uh, taken with a camera which I got from uh, Professor Jagdish. Hmm? It's not, uh, yeah, it's not in the same folder. Yeah, I can locate, but it takes time, let me read. So here what happens, The these pictures are taken with a uh, high-speed camera called Photron, which I borrowed from Professor Jaggi. I think Sriram helped me in uh, setting it up. <laughs> okay. So this we have recorded at uh, 2,000 pictures per second. Okay. From the uh, sensors which are inside the model, we know that the frequency is about 100 hertz. The oscillation frequency of shocks is about 100 hertz. So I thought if you sample it at uh, 2,000 frames per second, you should get good uh, time resolution of the image. So indeed it happened to be so. So when you run the movie, you can see these shock waves continuously going up and down. And I put this also on YouTube. So when you go home, you can just punch in words, supersonic air intake buzz, and you can see both these movies on YouTube. Okay, now how do I analyze this picture? Now today, earlier camera was just for fun. Just take some pictures and uh, keep it in your album. That was the idea. But slowly what is happening, these high-speed digital cameras, they can be used as sensors, optical sensors. Only you should be smart how to interpret the results. Okay. So here, in this case, what we did was, this is the cow lip. Okay, so this is the cow lip. Uh, this is in the supercritical condition now, or just about critical condition. And uh, after some time, the fl since the flow is unstable, the shock comes over here. So suppose I'm standing here. Suppose I take my, I define a reference point at this uh, location. And then I draw coordinate axis, x and y. So suppose this is my x. I stand at a particular y station. And then my shock is moving from left to right. So can I track that using intensity mapping? Okay. So you use MATLAB, convert this into grayscale, and find out where is the brightest pixels. Okay. In Schlieren, we can operate it in uh, two ways. You can see the shock as a, either as a white line or as a black line. It depends on how you are oriented the knife edge. Okay. In this case, the white represents the shock wave, and the black represents nothing. So the whatever is changing here is due to the shock. Okay. So if you're standing at this point, at this point, and you watch what is happening, shock will be going from left to right. 
Okay. So this way, if you scan the particular uh, ordinate and see how the shock changes with its position, you can get this kind of a <coughs> information. Okay. So this is for a given x at various y positions. So you can very nicely see the periodicity of the oscillation. Okay. This was the first uh, approach. Okay. So this is at various locations. As you go far away from the intake, the oscillation amplitude becomes smaller and smaller, but frequency is the same. Okay, so you can do a frequency spectrum. Uh, you take that as a signal and you do the discrete Fourier transformation, you get frequency of 102.4 hertz. Okay, and this is the same frequency what the sensor measures. So what this whole process is validated now. Whatever camera is telling me is the same thing as what the sensor says. But as uh, someone mentioned earlier, a sensor is the measurement at a point. This is a flow field measurement. Uh, what happens in the flow field is not necessary to be happening at the local location. So any understanding you get based on sensor data becomes local. It's not correct. Whereas here you're looking at the uh, entire uh, visualization. Okay, that is also got some limitations I'll show you later. So now uh, there's little mathematics here. You call this as a parameter x. Okay, so Okay, so the shock location, I am calling it as x, all right. Now we know the time between two pictures because this is discreetly taken at different at finite intervals of time. So we know the time interval and you look at the how x is changing with time and you can also see how x dot is changing with time, okay. The reason why we do that is a little mathematical, I explain that little later. So what you will find, if you plot x dot versus x, you get this type of shapes and these shapes are called phase portraits okay in a nonlinear equation if you are looking at the velocity versus displacement the answers you get they are all called as phase portraits okay and if the phase portrait is an ellipse then it's a solution of a nonlinear equation okay that equation is very popular especially controls people use it uh, very much so let me explain that okay so Okay, so this suggests that the governing equation for the phenomena must be a nonlinear equation. So the idea came or the challenge was posed, from the observation can you derive what is the equation? It's a reverse process. Usually you solve an equation and get a solution. Now I am taking this as a solution trying to find out what is the equation. Is that possible? That was the interest here. Okay, so now how do I control? How do I control this phenomena? <clears throat> now, basically, when you are burning the fuel, when you are increasing the pressure at the back, what is happening through the boundary layer, these pressure, the adverse pressure is communicated upstream. You have a supersonic flow, but you have a subsonic boundary layer. Okay, on the surface, above the surface, you have supersonic flow, but below the boundary layer, you have subsonic flow. So what happens, the disturbances propagate upstream through the boundary layer, and that affects the upstream flow. So suppose I remove the boundary layer or suck away the boundary layer, can I improve the stability? That was an interesting challenge. So in terms of the concept, it is something like this. Now if you have a channel with uh, four walls, the potential flow that goes through the intake becomes restricted because you have a viscous flow along the walls. So if you have a cross section like this, all around the corners you have viscous flow, right, <laughs> because of the boundary layer. Now suppose I make some provision to remove this boundary layer. Okay. I create a small gap and take away this boundary layer. Then I am enhancing the region of potential flow. So what I found is that if you do that, instead of, uh, okay, this is at, uh, yeah. These pictures are uh, without ventilation. I call it as ventilation because you're creating some ventilation for the pressure to escape. It's a natural ventilation process. So you just allow high pressure to escape. The gap should be so small that you are removing only the boundary layer. If the gap is too large, even potential flow will escape. So the gap should be controlled. So what, should, what is the optimum gap? So when you do that, you can see that uh, is, here the intake is in buzz condition and that Mach 3 width went, you can see it's become subcritical. 
sorry, uh, critical or super critical. So just by creating a small gap, allowing the boundary layer to escape, you can control this law. Okay, we have done some CFD also. So you can show that uh, when you did not have any ventilation, you had this uh, shock shock intersection and you had a big separation bubble. This is a separation bubble. And when you created the vent, you can see that you have attached now. So what CFD shows is in good support of whatever experiments show. Okay, so this is uh, uh, numbers I don't want to show. Now, buzz alleviation, okay. So this is a spectrum of pressure fluctuations inside the intake with and without control. So without control, you had those big peaks, okay. In fact, here what happened was the, the sensor got saturated. Every sensor has a certain range. And if it saturates, if you overload the sensor, then it, nothing will go wrong. But it takes time to return to initial condition, especially critical when you are doing unsteady pressure measurement. The sensor has a high frequency response. When you give a overload, it exceeds the output of the instrument or the sensor. and But it won't return immediately. It takes some time to go back. But before that, your experiment is over. Okay, So your results will become inaccurate because of overloading. But nevertheless, what you can see here is that when you had the ventilation, oscillations are completely suppressed. So flow has become uh, super critical. And in terms of numbers, you can see what is the benefit. The uh, These are the different uh, uh, Mach numbers. This is the gap, and which is the configuration, what kind of ramp you had. And this is the increase in area. Now what happens when you increase the, when you create this gap, you are increasing what is called the capture area. The intake is becoming bigger and bigger because your projected area becomes more, okay? So you calculate the ideal mass flow rate considering the increase in area and you actually measure what is the improvement in mass flow or whatever is the change in mass flow. So what you will find is that the pressure recovery has improved, uh, okay, uh, from uh, whatever was there, improvement was 12.8 all the way up to 52%, okay? And improvement in pressure recovery from 20% to nearly 30%. So the intake is now much more stable. So you can have more, um, you know, increased uh, fuel consumption. You can burn fuel at a faster rate and the intake is still in the supercritical range. That is the utility. Now, okay, so let me go to the next one very quickly. And whoever is going to NL must have ID card, otherwise there will be a problem. 
రేగుంటలో విమర్శ వైదిక స్టూడెంట్ ఐడి కార్డ్ ఇది కూడా Yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah. I request Chintu also to be present if possible. Okay, very good. Yeah, but after tomorrow probably there are any other branches they can join, but not for tomorrow. Tomorrow it will be six to go to the community, uh, 8 or 6, and that's too early in time. Clear? Just clear. Okay. Is anyone want to go to the room? I'll finish in about 10 minutes. <laughs> What's that? Oh, that's what he said. Those who are going by bus, they can go proceed. All right, so this camera can take the, the, the speed of the recording here is uh, 2,000 pictures per second. Okay, so if you record for 5 seconds, you are going to get 10,000 images. So you have to understand what's happening, you know, or you can try to understand by building story around these images. So in this case, we had, I think, six seconds recording. So we had 12,000 images. Okay. And the frequency is about 100 hertz made from uh, physical measurements. So I've shown you here half a period of uh, change. So uh, you have five milliseconds. These are pictures at small, small instants of time. This is zero. At any, you can take any reference as zero, and then after one millisecond, two millisecond, three milliseconds, four milliseconds, five milliseconds. How exactly is the pattern changing? Now, I got an interesting idea how to understand these pictures, how to interpret from these pictures. So the idea is like this: any picture is basically a distribution of pixels. Any digital image is a distribution of pixels. Some are bright, some are uh, not so bright, and so on. So you convert this into you imagine that this is a matrix. Okay, you call it A I J, where I J represents the position of the pixel. Now, instead of looking at black and white images, convert them into grayscale. So you know what exactly is the distribution of black and white uh, pixels in this distribution. Now, uh, there is using MATLAB. Okay, so I'll take this as my first matrix. Now, the distribution I'll subtract from here. This I'll use as reference. I look at this minus this, that minus this, this minus that. this minus this and this minus that so i do it for say 10000 images then what i am trying to see is the change from one event to another event so i take the first picture as my reference and see how my error you call the change in these two matrices convert them into standard deviation of error and how the error is changing with time look at it for some 12000 pictures then what do i see Okay, so this is the logic behind this. So I reference is the first image, and uh, error your I image is the next image. Take the difference. Look at the mean square error, and you call X as the RMS of the error. Now let's look at this. Is essentially telling you how the refractive index is changing with time, because any Schlieren picture is an indicator of the change in refractive index. All right, so this is what turned out. This is error versus time. So you can see beautiful sinusoidal. fluctuation so whatever is contained in these images is now converted into a signal signal like uh, phenomena okay now i also if you do the uh, fourier transformation of this you get f1 f2 f3 f4 okay so these are discrete frequencies so whatever we are observing it has got a dominant frequency of f1 and f2 f3 f4 these are harmonics okay it turns out that f2 is 2 times f1 f3 is 3 times f4 is Four times, F1. So this is very typical of what happens in a uh, open reson open pipe resonance condition. If you have a pipe, you partially close the pipe and you allow the air to escape through that. Then it, it triggers open uh, pipe resonance condition, sometimes closed pipe resonance, 
if it is half open it triggers both as you know if it is closed pipe resonance you have f1 f3 f5 and so on if you have open pipe you have combination of both okay so this is a feature of the signal now to understand this let's under, uh, interpret like this the basic phenomena is f1 and there is some corruption or some interference coming from some other signal that triggers harmonics so let me cut off all the signals above f1 look at only the basic phenomena so you cut off you have a filter which took, looks like this all signals above f1 you cut off and understand only what is happening up to f1 okay so this is a filtered signal and uh, again i looked at x dot because as i told you x dot versus x if you plot and if you are getting the closed form trajectories it's a solution of nonlinear equation okay so this is the approach to determine the equation from the observation okay so this is what we got the uh, black color is unfiltered data and the red one is the filtered data so you can see beautiful elliptical path now this phenomena in engineering is called limit cycle oscillation okay in any self sustained oscillation the relation between derivative and the main parameter if it's got a elliptic shape that means it's a limit cycle oscillation the the physics behind that is that it's a self sustained oscillation where the amplitude is within certain limits that's why it's called limited okay so here the beauty of this approach is that if you are if you are solving this equation let's say your initial condition is outside this now the asymptotic solution to this these are instantaneous solutions the asymptotic solution is an imaginary ellipse okay and you, the experiment is done for a finite time so you have finite number of cycles suppose you had done this for infinite long time it would have converged into an ellipse that is the limit cycle ellipse okay so if you are solving an equation let's say your initial condition is here then solutions will go all around the ellipse and coalesce onto the ellipse from outside if your initial condition is inside it keeps on expanding and it coalesces with the outer ellipse that's a feature of limit cycle oscillation this was actually discovered by one uh, electrical engineer called van der pol i think he was a swedish um, mathematician i mean electrical engineer who discovered the feature of this equation okay so this feature the feature of this equation is that the solution has a limit cycle so i am saying that since there is a limit cycle oscillation the phenomena must be governed by this equation okay so this equation as you can see this is acceleration term and you have 1 minus x squared here this is what makes it non linear okay so this is a damping this is viscous damping that is elastic damping now what this means is that uh, to get a stable solution this should be equal to right side left hand side should be equal to right hand side so x double dot should be mu times this minus x then only you get a solution to this so let's say yeah, i'll assume that x equal to a sin omega t is a solution to this equation i'll make an assumption because answer is anyway sinusoidal the solution is a uh, elliptical solution so i can take it as sin omega t <clears throat> so i can plug in x double x dot x double dot and put into that and find out what is the value of mu mu is the damping term okay now if you look at this when uh, omega t tan theta has a feature that when theta is plus minus pi by 2 it becomes unbounded okay the value of tan theta for plus minus pi by 2 is infinity similarly if the denominator is zero it becomes a bowl okay you get it becomes infinite so the feature of this term is that it has got three poles when theta is plus minus pi by 2 and when theta is one my uh, sin inverse one by a okay <clears throat> so i am proposing that this is a model for oscillation shock oscillation during buzz right now people are trying to model the oscillation through cfd and through various other approaches for which damping is required damping term has not been defined so far this is the first attempt which tells you what is the what are the features of the damping okay so that is the novelty of this particular work so next what do we do so the actual governing equation is this so from the image processing approach i am able to de derive the equation for the oscillation okay so now if i want if i assume this these values 
and I assume the initial condition from the experiments. I should be able to integrate this. Okay, so this is a Simulink model which tells you how to integrate the Van der Poel equation. So you can get the damping derivatives from the uh, Simulink model. So now this is the most beautiful essence of the whole exercise. This is the amplitude. This is the amplitude of oscillation, and this is the damping. Now what you can see here, when the amplitude is peak, damping is peak. When the amplitude is minimum, damping is minimum. Okay. Similarly, when you have damping here, positive value, you have positive value. When you have negative damping, this is minus infinity. So the, the philosophy behind any self-sustained oscillation is that the damping and the forcing function, they should be synchronized. If damping is not, is opposite to the forcing function, then it becomes stable solution. Solution will not oscillate. If you want to have self-sustained oscillation, the damping and the forcing function, they should be synchronized. Okay, so this logic is very well explained by these uh, observations. Now, what do we do from that? Okay, so one, well, this is a very interesting approach which I am trying to initiate now. Uh, how do I, can I mathematically show that I can suppress? I want to suppress this shock oscillation. How do I suppress? Okay, so I have to solve this equation. So I can use a simulation model, use this equation. Now, what I do on the right hand side, I have FT. Left hand side, I have the natural solution which represents buzz oscillation. And on the right hand side, I define Ft as Ft plus tau. Okay, so this is a this is the same function with a phase difference. Okay, and this is a nonlinear relation, so you cannot easily estimate what is the value of phi. So what you have to do, do a Monte Carlo simulation. Okay, suppose I change Ft uh, sine omega t by sine omega t plus delta phi, let's say 15 degree. I solve this equation and I find out what is x dot. If that is a stable solution, x dot should be 0. Okay, because if the oscillation has stopped, x dot should become 0. So in my limit cycle, I should see only one point. Then the oscillation has stopped. So using this approach, we can do a mathematical modeling of this phenomena and sure, make sure that this works. Now you do an experiment. So this experiment, I call it as a feed forward controller. So what you do in the, in behind the uh, throat, you have a um, microphone, you measure what is the frequency of, this, of the signal which is coming and you've, you have a set of speakers in the front on the ramp and you create the same amplitude, same frequency with a phase difference. That phase difference comes from this expression. Now, it's like cancelling two signals. You have one signal, you have another signal with a phase difference, and you set up a constructive interference, rather destructive interference. Then signal should become zero. Can I stop this oscillation? So if you are successful, we will be developing the first acoustic-based or microfluidic controller for control of air intake buzz. That is the advantage of this approach. Okay, now let me come to next uh, topic. Okay, this was a problem again posed by ISRO. This is called advanced technology demonstrator using scramjets. Okay, here they have a vehicle which is about 10 meters in length. And this vehicle has a booster and a sustainer. Booster is a solid rocket and uh, sustainer is a uh, scramjet. So the mission profile is like this. You start from zero. And uh, this is altitude, so you fire it up to about 40 kilometers. And then the solid rocket is over, it's separated. So vehicle starts coming down. Now when it's coming down, when it reaches about 30 kilometers, you start the scramjet. Okay, And you burn the scramjet for about a few seconds, and you should reach here. Now ramjet, scramjet combustion should stop. If this works in, the, in this way, then your uh, target is achieved. The target is you fire it from Sri Kota within uh, say less than a minute, it should land at a point in, in, in uh, Bay of Bengal, which is about 300 kilometers from Sri Kota. So if you are able to pick up the vehicle at 300 kilometers, that means your mission is successful. Okay, in addition to other parameters, of course, combustion parameters and all that, that's the objective. Can you make a demonstrator for scramjet technology? Okay, for that, what is the challenge? Okay, now it turned out that uh, the Cruise is a Mach number is six. 
it should fly at Mach 6 at those conditions. In NAL, there is no Mach 6 wind tunnel. There's only, the maximum limit is only 4. Okay, now if you look at the Aerotech design, it is such that the first ramp, if I rotate the model so that the free stream is aligned to the first ramp, huh? sorry, second ramp, not first ramp, second ramp, then the local Mach number will be 3.7. Okay, so you, it has three shocks. The first ramp gives you, uh, before the first ramp you have Mach 6, after the first ramp you have Mach 3.7. So if I rotate my model such that a 3.7 flow is aligned to the wind, then I am simulating the Mach 6 condition, only as far as intake is concerned, not other things, only intake. Okay, now intake has a cow lip. So during flight, what happens is, uh, this is closed. When it's flying, it's closed. Until it reaches Mach 6, it is closed. And depending on the, as per the flight mission, the time allowed to open the cowl is only 200 milliseconds. Within 200 milliseconds, the cowl should open and air intake should start. So that, and then combustion can start. So how do we have the combustion in this? Okay, so there are wedges kept inside the intake. And uh, the, uh, behind these wedges, you have a wake. And in the wake, velocities are very low. So you create flame inside the wake. Okay, so don't show the flame directly to the supersonic flow. And incidentally, the Mach number here is supposed to be, it is in the throat. Sorry, in this region where combustion happens, Mach number is supposed to be 1.1. Okay, so at such a high Mach number to sustain flame, you put a wedge, like V-shaped wedge. And behind the wedge, the velocities are zero because you have a wake. And there you initiate the flame. Okay, and then flame is not directly seeing the flow. But the flame spreads and fills up into the combustion chamber. That's the idea. So the, um, the challenge here is, how big can this be? How big can this be? In other words, how much blockage can it can I afford? Can I block 20%? Can I block 50%? Can I block 40%? How much can I block? Because I have to design this uh, strut. So how what should be the thickness of this uh, wedge? Now it turned out that uh, the physical scaling of the model, of the flight vehicle, if I truncate it, that is up to the station where it's 3.7, I could test the flight intake itself. One is to one size. And it turned out that both the Mach number and the Reynolds number for flight vehicle could be matched with the tunnel. So that's an ideal simulation case. You are simulating the upstream condition and you have the same Mach number, same Reynolds number as in flight. So everything related to boundary layer thickness, potential flow aspects, everything is matched with the wind tunnel. Now only challenge is how do you open in 200 milliseconds? Okay, so in flight, they use pyro actuators. That is, you burn some explosive and the cowl opens instantaneously. But in the wind tunnel, you can't use that because you may have to use it 25 times. And 25 times you can't put the pyro, pyro device. So I used a uh, hydraulic actuator. And this hydraulic actuator is kept outside the wind tunnel and the actuator should open the cowl in 200 milliseconds. How do you verify that? So these are all challenges which have to be answered. So it turned out that it was uh, quite useful. So this is a model in the tunnel, and when the cowl is closed, it looks like this. When the cowl is open, it looks like that, and this is aligned to the flow. So I start the flow at 3.7. So this is simulating what happens at Mach 6. Okay, so this is the intake model. It's a pretty big, one, pretty big model. I think it was the largest model ever tested in any at such a high Mach number. And this is a hydraulic system, hydraulic power pack, which is outside. So you can program it after, uh, within a few seconds after the wind tunnel starts. You can give a command to this, and the cowl opens. And after the test is over, you can close the cowl. So I have a video I'm not able to play. Okay, so this is the. This is a place where sensors are mounted. So for safety, they have been covered with a tape. Now it's in the closed condition. When you run, run the movie, you can show that it opens very fast. So this is a demonstration outside the testing area. Okay, so what I'll show you here is that uh, the during testing, the blockage was changed. We had three numbers, 20%, 30%, 25%, 30%. And these are spectrograms, which tells you what is the energy content at various uh, locations, sensor locations. So here, you'll find that the energy content is minimum and the intake has started. 
for this condition. For these two conditions, the intake failed to start. Okay. So there are other evidences also to show that. Okay, these are the spectra of pressure fluctuations. When the intake starts, you have a low level of fluctuation, and then when the intake does not start, you can see the amplified disturbances because the shock wave is oscillating. So you get these large fluctuations. So at three different places, uh, we have measured these fluctuations and proved that the intake will start if you have 20% blockage. So these are the phase portraits from the measured from the obtained from the pressure signals. So when the intake starts, you will find that this is a dot. That means the fluctuations are zero. So you have a single point. Other places you see this elliptical profile. It looks very bad because the number of data points here is few hundred thousand. So it's all cluttered. Okay. So the fact is that it was able to start at this condition. Other conditions it was not able to start. Okay. So these are uh, spectra. Uh, when the intake starts, you have very low level of for spectral density. This is uh, 2000. And when the intake does not start, this is 10 power 5. And you have huge peaks in the unsteady pressure. So this is the evidence that intake was able to start. Subsequently, this was also flown. Okay, this is the conclusion. You, you must restrict it to 20% or less, not more than that. Then uh, when it does not start, these are the dominant frequencies that happen. This is important for the structural design. Suppose you are designing the vehicle and it does unstart. Then those frequencies are 45 hertz, 65 hertz. So you design the structure for that. Intake does not start, but it should not fail. Vehicle should not fail. So what is the outcome? On 28th August, the second test flight, which was called ATV, it was launched from Satish Dhawan Center, had a mass of 3.2 tons, and uh, it carried active uh, demonstrator. After 55 seconds, the scramjets ignited at Mach 6 and functioned for about 5 seconds. And the total flight was 300 seconds, and the vehicle splashed down at 320 kilometers from three record. It was picked up from 320 kilometers. So this shows the utility of wind tunnel testing, how wind tunnel testing and understanding of the unstart start phenomena can result in a successful mission. So, okay, so the, the actual vehicle has two engines. One sustained combustion for 18 seconds, or the other was about 14 seconds. It provided positive thrust. Otherwise, it would not have gone to 300 kilometers. So imagine 300, uh, uh, 320 kilometers covered in about uh, 300 seconds. How, how much it should have, how fast it should have traveled. That's the advantage of hypersonic flow, hypersonic flow. 300 seconds is five minutes. In five minutes, you can't even go out of this Kudlu traffic gate. But vehicle has gone 320 kilometers. Okay, let me stop here. I'm sorry, I exceeded the time a little bit. This shawl is for outsiders. I'm an insider. It's not for me. No, sir, no, sir. For the rich. You can't escape. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Siddhi or someone was asking whether you can use it, use a shockwave as a propelling, uh, as a weapon. Uh, Siddhi, I want to answer your question whether you can use the shockwaves as a weapon. Yeah, we can. There is one uh, sand, uh, it is at Brown's Univers Brown University in the US. They have built a shock tube, combustion driven shock tube. Okay, so there you, ex you create combustion and due to that high pressure, one piston travels. And the piston, uh, where the piston ends, it builds a huge pressure and that ruptures a diaphragm. And then high pressure shock uh, goes through the system. And there they put a projectile and measure the speed of travel. Can you imagine how fast it could be? 12 kilometers per second. So if there was a gun based shock... Uh, it's called laser, it's called light gas gun. So light gas guns are, they make use of this concept. You can shoot uh, projectiles. I'll show you my, I also shot some projectors. I'll show you later. <laughs> Sir, sir, you need to... Oh, is it? Come, come, Ravant, come. <laughs> hey, you can click, click, come here and then go back <laughs> at <laughs> Super Sonic Speed. will go over there and last. Cheese. Say samosa. All of you guys say samosa. Yes, samosa. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I hope I didn't bore. Guys, it's really good. Our understanding is still not that level. Okay, sir, what time? 10.